So hello and welcome everyone to the fifth lecture in the Consciousness and Reality Colloquium series, which seeks to inspire interdisciplinary investigations on topics such as mind, cognition, consciousness, and the nature of reality. I'm Kunal Mule, a research scientist in the Division of Physics, Math, and Astronomy at Caltech, and the co-founder of IMIX, which is the Institute for Mind, Intelligence, and Consciousness Studies. So the theoretical physicist, Max Planck, speaking to a reporter, news reporter in 1931, said that I regard consciousness as fundamental. I regard matter as a derivative of consciousness. We cannot get behind consciousness. So if this view of reality is true, then it opens up a Pandora's box of research questions on consciousness and reality, which are waiting to be addressed. And today's speaker, will give us a glimpse on these kinds of questions. So I'm pleased to welcome today Jim Tucker to present on does consciousness uh, continue after we die? So just some logistics before we introduce the speaker. Uh, selected questions from the Q&A box will be taken after the talk. So I encourage all of you to submit uh, your questions through the Q&A button that you can see at the bottom of the Zoom window. Um, and just to make this a little more interactive, uh, we, are going to, we are going to have a poll, okay? So you can click on the poll button at the bottom, again, of your Zoom window to answer two simple yes, no questions, okay? So let me go ahead and launch this poll for you so that all of you will be able to access this. There are two questions here, simple yes, no. One is, they, <clears throat> would, both are basically, would you agree with these statements kind of questions, okay? So the first one is, there is a need to explore mind and consciousness phenomena beyond brain and biology. And the second one is, we can experience objective realities beyond just the physical world as we know it, okay? So yes, no questions on whether you agree with these statements, okay? So you're free to, uh, <clears throat> of course, uh, sit through Jim Tucker's talk and then answer these questions later, but the poll will be on until the Q&A session. Okay, so feel free to please go into the poll button and answer these questions. I will announce the results of the poll at the end of the talk. So, uh, and with this, I would uh, request Caltech professor Peter Schroeder to please introduce our speaker, Jim Tucker. Okay, thank you, Kunal. Uh, as Kunal said, my name is Peter Schroeder. I'm a professor over in computing and mathematical sciences. And it's a distinct pleasure to introduce today's speaker on a subject that I myself have found fascinating. And uh, it is Jim Tucker, who is the Bonner Lowry Professor of Psychiatry and Neurobehavioral Sciences at the University of Virginia. Uh, he's also director of the UVA's Division of Perceptual Studies, uh, which has looked into these questions of children remembering past lives for a long time. Uh, Jim holds a BA in psychology and an MD from the University of North Carolina Chapel Hill. He's also a board certified child psychiatrist. Being intrigued by Ian Stevenson's work in 1999, he began working half time at the Division of Perceptual Studies on children's reports of past life memories. Uh, and I remember reading Ian Stevenson's book as I was awaiting the birth of my own first son, uh, wondering whether he had some stories to tell when he came. He did not, but it is a subject uh, that has been quite intriguing. And the case studies have been very carefully vetted. So I'm curious to hear more about this today from Jim. Uh, he was fascinated by this. And just a year later, he in fact gave up his private practice to work full time at the Division of Perceptual Studies. And in 2002, after Dr. Stevenson's retirement, took over the past life memories research at the division. Uh, this has led to uh, several books, three books that he has published, a number of journal papers, and also some popular media attention. Uh, with that, uh, I want to hand it over to Jim to hear what he has to uh, share with us today. Uh, well, thank you, Peter and Knoll. Uh, it's very nice to be here. And let me see if I can share my screen successfully. All right. And... All right. Um, so 
Does Consciousness Continue After We Die, which I, I hope is a slightly provocative title, and but it's also the question uh, that we at the University of Virginia um, Division of Perceptual Studies have been trying to answer uh, for decades now. And uh, we focus on extraordinary experiences like past life memories, as, as Peter mentioned. Um, so we explore the questions of can um, consciousness exist apart from the brain and uh, can it potentially survive after the brain dies? And uh, this is work that's been going on for a long time. Um, Peter mentioned Ian Stevenson, who is our founder. Uh, he came to UVA in 1957 to be the, the chair of psychiatry. And <clears throat> at the time, um, he was in the middle of quite a successful mainstream career. He was is still in his late 30s when he came here to be chair and had published scores of papers, uh, mainstream papers, uh, particularly on um, um, psychosomatic kinds of things. Uh, but he also had an interest in parapsychology. He hadn't done any research in it, but had an interest in it. And then after he had um, been here a while, he became intrigued by this phenomenon, uh, these reports from various places of young children saying that they remembered a past life and um, started studying the cases and um, got more and more involved in them. So uh, after 10 years of being chair in 1967, he stepped down as chair uh, with the help of some uh, generous donor and uh, started this research division, uh, which we now call the Division of Perceptual Studies. Um, this is most of our current team uh, that the uh, woman on the far left, Kim Penberthy, uh, is a psychologist who recently has been doing a lot of work on uh, what's called after death communications. Uh, where people feel like they are getting uh, messages or communication of one kind or another from their deceased loved one. Um, and uh, we'll talk about some of the other people in the picture, but um, Bruce Grayson, who is the one seated next to me, uh, is uh, quite an expert in near-death experiences, and he is now uh, officially retired, but continues to do a lot of work with the help of uh, Marietta Pelovanova, who's, who's the one in the, in the orange uh, shirt, um, again, focusing on one area of our work, near-death experiences. So Bruce is one of the world's leading experts, and, and really the world's leading expert on near-death experiences. He's published far more papers on the topic on NDEs uh, than anyone else has, and a couple of years ago, he um, finally, after writing scores of papers, uh, came out with a, a book for the general public uh, called After, in which he, he reviews his decades uh, of work in the field and um, kind of what he has learned, along with a lot of, of uh, great cases. Um, I imagine that most people are aware of near-death experiences, but uh, let me just tell you a little bit about the phenomenon. So it's after, um, it's when people get very close to death, either they have cardiac arrest or they are close to cardiac arrest. And people in that situation, about 15 to 20% of them will describe being aware uh, during this time of, of essentially being at the point of death. And um, many of them talk about feeling very comfortable and free of pain as, as they are detaching from their physical body, uh, as their consciousness is detaching from it. Um, they'll often have a sensation of leaving the body, sometimes looking down and seeing the physical body from a perspective uh, above the body. And they report that their mind functions more clearly, more rapidly than usual. Um, then they will often have a sensation of, of going through a tunnel, or not necessarily a tunnel, but going through a, an area of darkness. Um, so they're 
they happen in cultures uh, where they, there are no tunnels, uh, but they often still report going through this, this um, passage of darkness. And then many report seeing a brilliant light or sometimes a beam of light, uh, sometimes at the end of the tunnel. Uh, in the presence of this light, they will feel a sense of overwhelming peace, well-being, or, or absolute unconditional love. Um, many of them will identify this light as, as being God and, and sensing unconditional love from it. Uh, they also often have a sense of unlimited knowledge. So people talk about a life review, but it's not necessarily that they see a series of events, but more that they see their entire life at once. And, and some of them will describe having kind of um, 360 degree um, awareness and knowledge of, of uh, knowledge being around them 360 degrees. Uh, including sometimes previews of, of future events, uh, and then occasionally uh, images from what they interpret as past lives as, as well as their current life. Um, so this kind of all-knowing kind of experience. And then some of them will also talk about encountering uh, deceased loved ones or other beings that they uh, identify as being uh, religious figures. Uh, these experiences can lead to evidence of survival that they actually, uh, their consciousness did survive um, <clears throat> through several different ways. One, they report enhanced cognition, even though their brains are completely impaired and, and EEGs completely flat, uh, no cortical activity, and yet they are reporting profound experiences and uh, with a very sharp uh, intent um, uh, sense of mind. Uh, some of them describe accurate out-of-body perceptions. So I mentioned they'll look down on the scene. Uh, they may describe um, who the people were that were performing a code on them or things they did, like uh, one person who um, saw a person later and said, oh, you're the one who took my false teeth out. Um, sometimes they even witness things in other parts of the building or occasionally in other parts of town uh, that proved to be accurate, the things that were actually happening during the time. And then when they talk about seeing deceased people, um, sometimes the deceased person will give them accurate information uh, that they did not know about first, but are later able to verify that, in fact, what the person said was true, what the spirit individual said was true. And there are also cases where they will come across somebody who they did not know had died, and they will talk about things, sometimes getting messages about uh, how the previous person's doing or what happened to them. Uh, so there are stories where someone has an experience like this, and then the next day the family uh, gets a telegram or a phone call or whatever saying that this other loved one had, had passed away, um, but the, the person who had the experience did not know that at the time until they met them during their near-death experience. Um, near-death experiences can also be therapeutic. Um, uh, Bruce and a psychiatry resident uh, published this paper where they gave a spiritual well-being scale uh, to over 200 individuals who had come close to death. And when they looked at the ones who had had the NDEs uh, versus the ones who hadn't, uh, what they found was that the uh, um, degree uh, of those who had NDEs had greater well spiritual well-being than those who had not and that the degree of spiritual well-being correlated with the depth of the near-death experience. Um, and they also observed that um, there are attitudes that often decrease after a near-death experience. So uh, fear of death often goes down often to zero. So these people say, um, I know there's life after death because I've experienced it, and, and they don't uh, it doesn't make them suicidal. In fact, people who have attempted suicide after a near-death experience do not attempt suicide again. 
but it makes them um, uh, not um, have any fear about what will come next. Uh, they tend to become kind of more spiritual in general. They, they get much less interested in material possessions, uh, which can lead to, for instance, marital conflicts. Uh, there's one case Bruce studied where the wife complained that the springs will be coming out of the, the uh, couch cushions and everything else, and, and the guy just no longer cared about those things. Uh, people also show less interest in status and, and achievement, um, uh, but more uh, or competitiveness, uh, but instead just more uh, kind of appreciate the experiences that they have in life. Um, but it's not always idyllic, and, and many of them also have trouble adjusting to life after the NDE because they are not necessarily the same person that they were before they had this profound experience. Um, so that's one area that, uh, that we specialize in. Uh, we also have a, a neuroimaging lab. And um, these two fellows were in the group picture. Uh, Ed Kelly is a, a neuroscientist. Uh, Ross Dunseith is, a, uh, is an engineer. And <clears throat> what they were able to set up about, I don't know, 10 or 15 years ago with the with help again of a generous donor, uh, Ray Westfall, was to set up a neuroimaging lab um, primarily focused on uh, EEG. And um, um, what they do is they will put connect subjects to a uh, uh, 128 lead uh, EEG cap and then measure what is going on in their brains while they are trying to have um, anomalous experiences. So they, they get put in a, a shielded room. You, you see the person there in a the shielded room where it's shielded both acoustically, but also electromagnetically. So there is no possibility that they're getting any sort of communication from outside. And they try to have them do things like various uh, kinds of e, uh, ESP kind of tasks. Um, sometimes trying to get them to do out-of-body experiences. Uh, with some, they uh, there is what's called a sender in another room who's trying to send images to this person. And again, they know they're not communicating surreptitiously because that would be impossible. Uh, and then they get judged on, on um, what images that they report experiencing them. Um, they have recently completed studying uh, a group of mediums, people who claim to be able to communicate with the dead, and uh, it's produced a mountain of EEG data, and, and now they have to analyze it to, again, look at this connection between not just consciousness and the brain, but also the consciousness during extraordinary experiences and, and what is happening in the brain uh, during that time. Um, Ed Kelly has also been the, the uh, principal force behind three uh, significant books, um, Irreducible Mind, which is uh, 800 pages. Uh, Ed was, was uh, one of the co-editors along with his wife, Emily. Um, uh, looking at phenomena that are very difficult to explain with sort of current purely biological understandings of mind. Then the second book, Beyond Physicalism, uh, looking at sort of theories or models that can explain consciousness phenomena that, that cannot be explained easily uh, through um, current understandings. And then Consciousness Unbound, the, the last one, uh, reviews empirical phenomena uh, of extraordinary experiences, including uh, I have a chapter in it about past life memories, uh, and their significance for our understanding of reality. Um, so, again, my uh, primary focus is children's, uh, children who report memories in their past life, and uh, this is work that Ian Stevenson, uh, our founder, started. Uh, he took his first trip to study these cases in 1962, uh, so it's been, the work has been going on now for 60 years, and he had heard about some cases uh, in India and decided to have a trip, take a trip. Uh, by the time of the trip, he learned about five cases, and then he went there for a month and found 25. And he got similar results in, in Sri Lanka, or Ceylon, as it was known then. 
And he realized that this phenomenon of young children reporting past life memories was a lot more common uh, than anyone, at least in the West, had any idea about. Um, so he began taking more trips. And uh, this picture is uh, when he was in Burma. Uh, but he traveled all over, mostly in Asia, but, but other places as well. And, and in fact, cases have been found wherever anyone has looked. Uh, they've been found on all the continents. Uh, except Antarctica, of course. Um, and that includes cases here. Um, so as Ian studied these cases, <clears throat> he always took a very careful, methodical approach to them. He never assumed that they were due to reincarnation, uh, but more he was trying to sort out exactly what had happened, uh, what the child claimed to remember, and, and how well that matched up with somebody who did, in fact, uh, live and die in the past, uh, published numerous books and countless papers on this phenomenon. Uh, one of his books was reviewed in JAMA, uh, the Journal of the American Medical Association, uh, and actually by the book review editor, um, who wrote that in, re in regard to reincarnation, he has painstakingly and unemotionally collected a detailed series of cases from India cases in which the evidence is difficult to explain on any other grounds. He has placed on record a large amount of data that cannot be ignored. Um, he continued to like, collect cases, study cases, continued to work. I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about a, a book that he published uh, toward the end of his career. Um, he officially retired in 2002, uh, but continued to do quite a bit of work, including taking one more um, trip to India. Um, his, his wife once said that she didn't mind him taking the trips, but she just wished he would stop saying that each one was going to be his last trip. Um, and then um, continued to work almost until the very end and, and then passed away in, in 2007 by the age of 88. Uh, but the work has continued. And we have studied over 2,500 cases from around the world. Um, I have focused mostly on American cases. Um, I feel like, uh, well, first of all, if, if 2,000 cases from Asia can't convince people to, uh, to look at this work, I, I didn't feel like there was any number that could. But I, I feel like if, if we document that there are cases you know, liable to be down the street from where you live, and it can't be dismissed as just some sort of foreign thing that takes place far away. And also, the American cases don't have the potential kind of cultural contaminants uh, that could affect the Asian cases, because here we do not have a general belief in reincarnation, and most of the families we hear from um, didn't believe in reincarnation either, uh, at least until their children started talking about a past life. So let me give you an example uh, of one of the cases that I studied. Uh, this was a little boy from Ryan, uh, named Ryan <clears throat> from Oklahoma. We got a uh, letter from his mom one day when he was five years old. And she said how for the past year, he had talked about wanting to go home to Hollywood. And he would, um, uh, talk about this past life and, and cry and beg his mom to take him back home to Hollywood. Um, this went on enough and was intense enough that uh, she decided to get some books about Hollywood from the public library to see if they could kind of help him process all of this material. They were looking through one one day when they came to this picture from an old movie called Night After Night. And Ryan pointed to the um, second fellow from the left there, said, hey, mama, that's George. We did a picture together. And then he pointed to the one on the far right and said, and mama, that guy's me. I found me. Well, the first one he pointed to uh, was George Raft, who was a well-known actor back in his day. Um, pretty obscure now, but it's quite well known. Uh, but the one that he said he had been was an extra with no lines in the movie. So Ryan's mom wrote to me to see if I could help figure out who this guy was. Um, so I went out to Oklahoma and 
met the family and, and talked with them. And then afterwards, as we're trying to figure out this person, uh, Ryan's mom was sending me emails, sometimes on a daily basis, about all of these statements that Ryan was making about his past life. Um, and frankly, I, I thought it was kind of unlikely that this guy with no lines in the movie had had this life that Ryan described. Um, eventually, we were able to figure out who he was with, with the help of a Hollywood archivist. Uh, she went to the library of the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences, got out all the materials on this movie, Life After, uh, Life After Life, Night After Night, and most of which was about the stars. Uh, but then she found this one picture, and on the back of it, it said, what the well-dressed racketeer will wear, Marty Martin playing a racketeer in Paramount's Night After Night, with George Raft and the other stars, uh, gives a demonstration of underworld sartorial excellence. Um, and then I, I watched the movie again to make sure we had the right guy, and, and Marty Martin's uh, family later confirmed that, in fact, that it was um, who Ryan had pointed to. Um, so Marty Martin, uh, he died in 1964, so it's been a long time, um, but it turned out that he did have uh, the kind of life that Ryan had described. So Ryan said how he had danced on stage in New York and uh, Marty Martin danced on Broadway. And Ryan said he then went to Hollywood and worked in the movies, which um, Marty Martin did working mostly on dance in the movies. Ryan said he then worked for an agency where people changed their names and Marty Martin started a successful talent agency. Um, Ryan said he saw the world from big boats and talked about going to Paris. Um, uh, Marty Martin and his wife went to Europe on the Queen Mary uh, and visited Paris. Ryan said that he had a big house uh, with a swimming pool, which Marty Martin did. And, and uh, Ryan said that the street address had the word rock or mount in it. And Marty Martin lived on North Roxbury. Um, he had a daughter who uh, was eight uh, when he died, uh, so we met with her, and there's a lot she didn't know about his life since she had been so young, including even about one of his sisters that he had, um, but between talking with her and the records we were able to dig up, um, we eventually uh, determined that 55 of Ryan's statements fit Marty Martin's life. Um, including, uh, he said one day that he didn't know why God would let you get to 61 and then make you come back again as a baby. Well, Marty Martin's death certificate said that he was only 59, so it looked like that was wrong. Uh, but then Marty's daughter and his stepson both said he was 61, so I looked into it. I found three census records, uh, two marriage listings, and a passenger list that all gave ages that meant, in fact, uh, Marty was 61 when he died. So even though the death certificate said 59, Ryan was correct when he said 61. Um, so to tell you about some of the, uh, the features in these cases, uh, it's typically very young children who talk about uh, a past life, and they do so spontaneous, spontaneously. Uh, this does not involve hypnotic regression or anything like that, but just that the kids start coming out with these things, typically describing recent ordinary lives. They, they are not talking about being uh, kings or queens or, or, or almost never talk about being famous individuals, uh, but rather somebody who um, typically live fairly close by. It's usually in the same country and um, just had kind of an ordinary life. Um, when I say a recent life, the average interval between the death of the previous person and the birth of the child is four and a half years. Now, there's certainly exceptions like Ryan's case where it was 40 years, but um, uh, often it's much shorter than that. Some of the kids will talk about being the deceased family member, but others will describe being a stranger uh, in another location like Ryan did. 
And if they give enough details, like the name of that location, then people have often gone and found that, in fact, there was somebody who lived and died whose life matches the statements that the child gave. Uh, when that happens, we say that it's a solved case. Uh, if a child talks about a past life, including someone's with great emotion, but they don't give details for that life can be confirmed, then we say it's unsolved. Uh, we have plenty of both kinds in our collection, but two thirds of the ones we've studied, uh, there is a previous person who's been identified. Um, the one part of the life that is often out of the ordinary is how the previous person died. So 70% um, of the previous people died by some sort of unnatural means. Uh, murder, suicide, combat, accident, that sort of thing, uh, which is way above what you would expect in the general population. So it raises um, the idea that that mode of death is an important part of this phenomenon. Um, so we've looked at that a little bit. So with all of the cases, uh, we code them on 200 variables and then put that information into a database. And it took us many, many years to get all the old cases coded. Uh, but we now have over 2,000 cases in the database. And we can look at various features, including uh, mode of death in the past life. Um, and I'll warn you, this graph looks a little confusing, uh, but it's not as complicated as it looks. So going up and down is the number of cases, and then going across is the age when the previous person died. Uh, the green bars on top are the natural deaths, and then the, all the other colors are various kinds of unnatural death. So the main point of this slide is to show that there are a lot of unnatural deaths. Um, but it also looks like people are dying young. The tricky part is that people who uh, die unnatural deaths tend to be younger. Uh, but what we can do with the database is we can pull out the unnatural death ones, look just at natural death to see if dying young is an independent factor from dying violently. Um, this next graph is just a typical graph of deaths by age uh, in the general population. So again, number of deaths going up and down across is the lifespan. And, and what you see is movement across the lifespan uh, you see this upsloping curve as, as gradually more and more people are dying until finally there's so few people left uh, in the 80s and 90s and beyond that, that it drops off short, uh, sharply. But for most of the lifespan, this gradually upsloping curve. Well, in our cases, uh, looking at the natural death cases, what we see is that the curve actually slopes the other way. Um, and a quarter of the cases, the uh, previous person was 15 years old or less. And again, this is natural death cases. So there seems to be something about dying violently or dying young that makes it more likely that a, later, uh, that a child will later talk about that life. Now, another thing that we've noticed from the database and that actually we've noticed for a long time is that more boys talk about a past life than girls, um, <clears throat> which is a little surprising since young girls tend to be uh, verbal earlier than, than boys, but about 62% of our cases, uh, it's a boy. Well, to try to figure out why that might be, uh, one way of looking at it is that uh, 90% of the cases, the child talks about being uh, a life um, uh, from the same gender. So we can look at um, gender in the past lives, and, and we see also the same ratio, 62% of the previous people uh, were male. But when we look at, at how they died, and the ones who died uh, by natural means, it's 50-50. It's the ones who died by unnatural means, uh, sudden violent kind of death, where in our cases, 73% um, of those were male. Well, um, men in the general population are, are more likely to die violent deaths uh, than women because they engage in more high risk behaviors. So they're more likely to uh, ride motorcycles or get in knife fights or, or 
whatever the case may be. Um, I looked up, I, I found five years of data from the CDC uh, that showed that males accounted for 72% of unnatural deaths in the general population. Um, in our cases, it's 73%. Uh, so thus the, the sex breakdown or gender breakdown uh, by mode of death for our collection of cases matches precisely what we would expect if in fact they are uh, a sample of lives from the past. Now getting back to the, uh, to the features, um, obviously the statements they make about a past life is, is uh, the main feature. And I said that as young children, um, <clears throat> The average age when a child starts talking about a past life is 35 months. So it's usually a two year or three year old uh, who will come out with these things. Uh, occasionally they'll even do kind of motions and stuff before they become verbal that later tie in with their statements about uh, the past life. And some of them will do it in sort of kind of a detached matter of fact way, but, but many of them show strong emotional involvement with this material like Ryan did. And, and they may um, um, cry on a daily basis, begging their parents to take them to their previous family and talk about how much they missed the previous family. Uh, some of them will show anger, uh, especially if the previous person was murdered. Um, they will show a lot of anger toward the person that they said did it. And in the stronger cases, uh, the kids tend to show more emotion. Uh, but regardless, <clears throat> they may show great intensity one minute and then just run off and play the next. And some of the kids have access to this material at all times, but uh, for others, they have to be in the right frame of mind to be able to access this. And it's usually during uh, relaxed times like um, after a bath or during a long car ride or something like that, where they start coming out with this information. Uh, and then by the time they get to be six or seven, uh, typically they stop talking about the past life and just go on with their current one. And, um, and um, most of them seem to lose the memories, but uh, as we've talked with adults who we originally studied as kids, as kids we find out the number of them retain at least some vague memories uh, that they say was of their past life. Now, what the kids say about what they talk about their past life, it, it, it tends not to be, um, they don't tend to be kind of little mystics with, with various words of wisdom. What, what they typically do is focus on uh, the end of the life. So three quarters of them will talk about the way that they died in the past life. And um, they will also typically focus on people from the end of the life or things that happened near the end. Um, so it's as if the memory has just picked up from where it left off at the end of the last life. Um, and think about 20% of them will talk about experiences that they said they had between lives. So after they died, uh, some of them talk about hanging around where they died or hanging around their previous family. Um, some of them will describe uh, observing their own funeral, uh, sometimes occasionally with verifiable details. So there was one girl in Thailand who, who made a lot of statements, but one thing was she complained that her ashes had been scattered rather than buried the way she wanted them to be. Well, the, uh, when the woman was, was identified, she had wanted her ashes uh, buried under the bow tree of the temple complex where she studied. But when her daughter went to bury them, uh, the root system of the tree was so extensive that she couldn't bury them, so she scattered them instead. Uh, and then some of the kids will talk about going to other realms um, like heaven. The American kids may use the word heaven. Um, and then some will talk about either observing their future parents or being guided to their, their future parents uh, to prepare for their next life. Um, another feature that we see in a number of these cases is, um, uh, as strange as it may seem, uh, birthmarks or full birth defects uh, that match wounds, usually the fatal wounds on the body of the previous person. So Ian, with his longstanding interest in psychosomatics, so the connection between mind and body, uh, he was um, um, 
really fascinated by these cases, started studying them, and uh, then started writing them up and took many years in the making, but he eventually published this two-volume set called Reincarnation in Biology, uh, which includes 200 such cases, uh, and it's uh, 2,000 pages long. Um, I can't go through all 200 cases, of course, but I'll show you a couple of pictures. So uh, there was a girl who remembered the life of a man who uh, got his fingers chopped off as he was being murdered. And the little girl was born with her fingers looking like that. Uh, there's another case of a boy who remembered a boy from another village who had lost the fingers of his, uh, his right hand in a fodder chopping machine. Uh, and the second little boy was born with his hands looking like that, quite an unusual defect. Uh, and then there's a boy who remembered the life of a man who was killed by a shotgun blast to the side of his head. And this little boy uh, was born with just a stub for an ear and an underdeveloped right side of his face. Ian also listed 18 cases uh, with two birthmarks, ones that matched both the entrance wound and the exit wound uh, on the body of a gunshot victim. Uh, and then another feature that we <clears throat> see are behaviors that often go seem to go with the memory. So I've mentioned the great emotion uh, that the kids can show. Um, in the cases of, of violent death, uh, over 35% of those have shown intense fear uh, related to the mode of death. So uh, for instance, there was one little girl who essentially from the time she was born, she hated being in water. It would take three adults to hold her down uh, to give her a bath when she was an infant. Um, and then when she got old enough to talk, to describe the life of a uh, girl in another village who had uh, drowned in an accident. Um, likes and dislikes. This picture uh, of a uh, young child smoking a cigarette uh, is not from one of our cases, but it could be. Uh, because unfortunately, uh, in cases where the previous person was a heavy smoker or heavy drinker, uh, the child will often show uh, a, a interest in those things. So the kids may try to sneak cigarettes or, or even alcohol. Uh, There's one case where a neighbor was actually letting a, a little kid have alcohol until his parents found out about it and put a stop to it. Um, Themes in the play. So a lot of these kids will play compulsively for hours on end uh, at something related to the uh, previous life, most often the previous person's occupation. Uh, so like there was one little boy that, that played at being a biscuit shopkeeper uh, to the exclusion of doing anything else and, and fell behind in school. Um, and um, his uh, mom felt like he really was never able to catch up after that. Um, gender nonconformity. So I've mentioned that in 10% uh, of our cases, the child will talk about uh, memories of being a different gender. So it, gender typical behaviors are ones that most children uh, show sort of stereotypical behaviors, really. But uh, so girls are more likely to want to play with dolls, little boys play with trucks. And, and of course, there are a lot of discussion about why that is, well, why they develop these, but, but certainly for most kids show this gender typical kind of behavior. Um, but about 3% of boys, young boys, and 5% of young girls will show gender nonconformity where their behaviors are more consistent with uh, a different gender. Um, so 3% of boys, 5% of girls in the general population. Uh, in our cases where the child has memories of being a different gender, 80% uh, of those children show gender nonconformity. Uh, sometimes that will persist all the way into adulthood. Um, other times it will actually fade as, um, as the statements fade and, and the other behaviors fade. Um, uh, most of them, all of this will kind of fade away and the, uh, the child will then just get fully wrapped up uh, in their current life. Uh, but these kind of behavioral things are, are um, evidence of a connection to the past life. But they also indicate that it's not just 
a transfer of information that that there are emotions that feelings emotions uh that there is this emotional aspect uh that seems to have uh carried over from uh, a past life um so I want to tell you about, um, and, and then I'll wrap things up, but I, I want to tell you about a, uh, a case that has some pretty prominent behaviors. A um, little boy named James Leininger, who, who's now a young adult, but, but when he was young, his, his, uh, this case got a fair amount of attention on, on TV. His parents eventually uh, read a book about it. Uh, but James is a little boy who remembered being a pilot who was killed during World War II, and uh, it's believed that that pilot has now been identified. So his uh, parents are this Christian couple in Louisiana, and his father in particular was completely opposed to the idea uh, of past lives um, before his, uh, uh, before he started talking about one. So the, the uh, story starts when, when James was 22 months old. Uh, his dad took him to a flight museum where he was fascinated by the exhibit of World War II planes, kept insisting on going back to it. Uh, so he and his dad spent three hours uh, in the museum. Um, and then a couple months later, around the time of his second birthday, James started having horrific nightmares over and over, multiple times a week, in which he would be uh, kicking his legs up in the air and screaming, airplane crash on fire, little man can't get out. And um, after I met with James and his parents, I also talked with his aunt who had spent a lot of time with him. She said, you couldn't believe how, how uh, disturbing these nightmares were to witness, that it really looked like somebody fighting for his life. Um, and then during the day, he would take his little toy airplanes and say, airplane crash on fire and bam, slam them into the coffee table. And his parents, uh, were apparently tolerant people uh, because their coffee table had dozens of scratches and dents where airplane crash on fire, bam. Well, that kind of behavior, that kind of play looks very similar to what we in children's mental health uh, refer to as, as post-traumatic play. After a child has been through trauma, uh, they will often reenact uh, the scene um, and when you combine that with the nightmares that James was having, he really did look like a traumatized child, uh, even though he hadn't been through any trauma, uh, at least in this life. And um, his parents were also able to have several conversations with him about this while he was awake. Uh, this was all when he was two years old. He said how his plane had crashed on fire. Uh, how it had been shot down by the Japanese, and he said how he flew a Corsair. Now, I'd never heard of a Corsair, but it was a, um, um, a special plane that was developed during World War II. And um, I looked into it. There was not a, a Corsair on exhibit at, at the Flight Museum when James and his dad went. They had had a Corsair, uh, but it had crashed at a uh, public air show, and they didn't get a replacement until three years later. Uh, so he did not see a Corsair there. Uh, he also said that he flew off of a boat. So his parents asked him the name of the boat. And he said Natoma, which seems like a pretty unusual name to guess for a U.S. aircraft carrier. Uh, in fact, his dad thought it sounded Japanese. Uh, but his dad then went and searched online. And he eventually found this information about the USS Natoma Bay. Uh, he printed out the information, and, and you probably can't see it, but the footer lists the date when he printed it out, which was August 7th, 2000. Well, James was born in April of 1998. Uh, so this documents that by the time he was 28 months old, that Natoma uh, was part of the case. Uh, it turned out that the USS Natoma Bay was stationed in the Pacific uh, during World War II. Uh, James's parents would also ask him who this little man was, who he had been, and he would always just say me or James, which they didn't make anything of at the time. Uh, they asked him one time who else was there, and he said Jack, Jack Larson. So again, this was all when he was two. And then when he was two and a half, uh, his father bought this book on the Battle of Iwo Jima for, to give to his father, James's grandfather. And um, he was looking through it one day when James came and got in his lap. 
And they got to this page and James painted, uh, pointed to the picture and said, that's where my plane was shot down. And his dad said, what? And he said, my airplane got shot down there, daddy. And that just floored his dad that his two and a half year old was saying that. Uh, he then learned that the Natoma Bay did take place, uh, did take part in the Iwo Jima operation. Uh, then when James got old enough to draw, he would draw dozens of pictures of battle scenes or planes, and he would always sign them James Tree, uh, which I thought might be because he was three years old, but his parents said, no, they asked him, and he said, um, I'm the third James, I'm James Three, which at the time they didn't make anything of. Um, um, and he continued to draw them that way uh, even after he was three years old. So eventually when his dad was four and a half, he went to an Atoma Bay reunion. And he learned that in fact, there uh, was a Jack Larson on the ship. He had been looking for Jack Larson's among the, uh, the war dead, but this Jack Larson had survived the war and was even still alive. So he went and visited Jack Larson and learned that in fact, he was on the ship during the Iwo Jima operation. Um, James has had also learned that there was one and only one pilot from the Natoma Bay who was killed during the Iwo Jima operation. And it was a young man, 21 year old man from Pennsylvania uh, named James Houston. So if, if James was remembering a past life, it had to be Houston's life since he was the only pilot from the Natoma Bay that was killed then. Um, so what we can do is compare statements that James made uh, with Houston's life. And, and these are the items where we have definite documentation that was made before uh, anyone knew anything about James Houston. Um, so James signed his drawings, James III. Uh, James Houston was James Jr., which would make James Leininger the third James. Uh, James said he flew off the Natoma. Houston was a pilot for the USS Natoma Bay. James said he flew a Corsair. Um, Houston had flown a Corsair. He was actually flying a different plane when he was killed, but he, he was part of the squadron that tested the Corsair for the Navy. Uh, James said he uh, was shot down by the Japanese. Houston was shot down by the Japanese. James said he died at Iwo Jima. Uh, Houston was the one Natoma Bay pilot who was killed during the Iwo Jima operation. James said one day, quote, my airplane got shot in the engine and crashed in the water, and that's how I died. Um, eyewitnesses reported that Houston's plane was, quote, hit head on right on the middle of the engine. James had nightmares of his plane crashing and sinking in the water. Uh, Houston's plane crashed in the water and quickly sank. And James said that Jack Larson was there. And Jack Larson was a pilot of the plane next to Houston's on the day that he was killed. So what do we make of all this? Uh, well, <clears throat> um, if you accept these cases, along with the near-death experiences, the other anomalous kinds of experiences, I don't think you can just map them onto a physicalist view of reality. <clears throat> Clearly, there is something else going on, that there is this uh, consciousness aspect uh, that is separate from uh, just the, our physical beings. Um, and um, going back to... Uh, Max Planck, actually, you know, if you look at quantum theory and the observer effect, uh, then you can make a strong case, I think, that reality is actually made up ultimately not of waves and particles, but made up of observations and the knowledge that this drives uh, or deduced from them. And uh, as Max Planck said, um, I regard consciousness as fundamental. I regard matter as derivative from consciousness. We cannot get behind consciousness. So if you look at these past life cases, um, if there is, if this world is made of observations, then what these cases seem to indicate is that there can be a continuation of observership across brains, that this line of observations uh, that inner someone's consciousness can continue on not only through the lifetime of one physical brain, but can actually continue uh, into another. 
and how it moves to another, you know, the mechanism is, is still to be determined. Uh, but that is, I think, a reasonable thing to, to consider from these cases. So it would mean that this line of observations is not uh, wholly dependent on the neural processes of a particular brain, uh, but can exist separate from them. Um, so the cases to answer the question of my talk, they, they provide that evidence that consciousness may indeed uh, continue on after we die. Uh, if you're interested in, in learning more about our work, here's our, our website and our email. Uh, we're also on, on Facebook and uh, YouTube. So I'll we'll stop there and sorry, I've run over a little more than what I hoped. Um, uh, but now I will turn things over to the others. Thank you very much, Jim, for that excellent talk and very thought provoking. Um, I'm going to share the results of the poll firstly. I know we are approaching the hour, but uh, uh, I hope everyone is able to see these results. If not, I'll just go over them right now. First question of the poll was, there is a need to explore mind and consciousness phenomena beyond brain and biology. Do you agree with the statement? And uh, not everyone answered, but 46 of the participants uh, answered uh, as yes, uh, sorry, 40 out of 46 who answered, answered the question as yes. And there were six participants or 13% who answered no. Uh, quite remarkable, actually, I must say at a place like Caltech. Uh, but the second question was, uh, we can experience objective realities beyond just the physical world as we know it. And 74% of the participants said yes, uh, that we can experience objective realities beyond the physical uh, world as we know it. And then 26% uh, said no. So um, uh, very interesting. Uh, but while the questions are flowing in, uh, I, I'd like to take this opportunity to get your insights on, on one important question, which is uh, related to our theme of interdisciplinary research, consciousness, and reality. Is uh, Would you mind, Jim, maybe speaking a little bit about the criticisms that you might have faced uh, with this kind of research? and uh, how you've addressed them and how we can work together as scientists, philosophers, psychiatrists like yourself and medical doctors to really address these pressing issues on mind, consciousness and the nature of reality. Yeah, I think as far as the criticisms go, unfortunately, um, often the critics are not particularly, uh, they don't know the material very well. And they, they can kind of dismiss it out of hand, which, you know, is not really a very scientific approach, I don't think. Uh, but there are people who look into them. There was a, a, a recent um, paper in the Journal of Scientific Exploration of people know about it, it, it um, explores sort of frontiers of knowledge, including physics. Um, but um, a guy, a philosopher, uh, wrote a 94-page uh, critique of the James Liner Group case that I, I just um, provided and put a lot of time into it. And, and then, um, in my view, kind of came with nothing. So I, I then had a rebuttal. Uh, but what the people will typically credit, well, there are many cases where we don't have written documentation of what the child said before the previous person was identified. So there's the legitimate concern that once the previous person was identified, that more information got credited to the child than they actually had about the past life. Um, and then um, there's a concern, could they have learned about the, the previous person through ordinary means with the same family case? You know, you never know for sure. Uh, but in cases like James Leininger's, uh, there, there are cases where, you know, very far away, a great time away, and we feel confident that that is not an explanation. Um, so there can be critiques, but I feel like we can answer them. Thank you. We have time for maybe just a couple of questions. Uh, and the first one is by a graduate student in biology, David Larios, uh, who says or asks exactly uh, <clears throat> when Basic biomolecules were generated by Earth 4 billion years ago. Did the first cell acquire consciousness? Or if consciousness exists separately from matter, then at what point does the collection of matter gets impregnated with 
consciousness? These are all pressing questions. I know they might be outside of your purview of um, uh, expertise, but again, I mean, these are very important research questions, I feel, David, which should be addressed uh, through collaboration with Jim, perhaps. And uh, yeah. just uh, uh, the last sentence of his question is, I'm making artificial cells in the lab, systems out of thermodynamic equilibrium regenerating their components is my little thing conscious. So great questions, but I'd like to get your insights perhaps, Jim, on this. Uh, uh, yeah, and I can't say much about the, the uh, little cells in the lab, but so as I was mentioning earlier, my take, and I mean, I didn't come up with it, but the uh, sort of idealism where uh, reality is made up of observations, that means that, and, and um, what was his name, John, um, huh, I've lost it. There, there was someone who wrote a lot about the participatory universe, um, arguing that the past only comes into existence when it is observed. Um, and um, boy, I almost had it on uh, the tip of my tongue, but um, he was a huge figure in the field. In fact, he gave black holes their names uh, along with a lot of other uh, accomplishments. But so his point was you could take that all the way back to the beginnings of the universe. And so the past looks like, you know, it's been around for 13 billion years or whatever, um, but it's only when uh, it, it had to develop the way it did so that there could be observers because otherwise th there is no existence. So it it's not like when uh, life began four billion years ago that suddenly the past all came into being, but more that once things evolved where there was uh, things capable of observing, that then that led to the the past that would have produced those beings. Hopefully I didn't lose you completely. But I, so uh, some people talk about panpsychism where everything has consciousness. Um, that doesn't connect with me. I mean, if, if a rock has consciousness, then um, I, we need to redefine what I think conscious means. Uh, but I mean, there are a lot of serious minded people say that, but, but, uh, but I do think that ultimately everything is derived from consciousness. Thank you. Uh, just another quick question is, uh, um, I think a couple of questions echo this, but uh, uh, if consciousness is primary and not an emergent property of matter, then what additional scientific data do we need to collect in order to support this hypothesis? Your data, by the way, is very impressive and incredible, uh, is what one of, one of the uh, persons asking the question says, and uh, are there any alternative explanations that we could consider for the kind of phenomena that you presented? Well, as far as other explanations, I mean, I, I think if you look at our strongest cases, I mean, there's certainly, there's good evidence that, at least under certain circumstances, consciousness is not dependent on just one brain, and in fact, carries over to another. Um, as far as the, the um, question about uh, the first part of that now, also about um, matter being derived from consciousness. I mean, where the evidence for that is coming, of course, is is in quantum physics and and the you know the studies of how um, observations are affecting the paths, for instance, of that particles took before they were observed, and and, um, and that that's all completely mainstream, mind-boggling kinds of stuff that certainly indicates that the, the world does not function uh, the way that our day-to-day -day experience tells us it does. All right, with this, I think we'll have to come to a close, but before we do, I just have some final announcements and I forgot to mention this earlier, but as we do after each colloquium gym, um, if you're available, we would Really love to have uh, a quick follow-up discussion session with you sometime in the next two weeks, um, if you're available. And graduate students and postdocs are especially welcome to attend and contribute to the session. So stay tuned for more information uh, on that. And the next colloquium in the Consciousness and Reality series is going to be um, on May the 31st, given by uh, Bernardo Castrop, who is the executive director of Essentia Foundation. And details of this colloquium will be announced across Caltech next month. 
Um, so with this, uh, I would like to thank Jim Tucker again, Peter Schroeder, to all participants and everyone who made this event possible. Please have a great day.